There are champion shooters, there are champion coaches, and there are champions that can coach. Harlan Campbell Jr. certainly fits into the latter category. With over a dozen Grand American rings to his name, this ATA Hall of Famer has a reputation as a great communicator in sharing the knowledge that he's learnt about the basic fundamentals and mechanics of trap shooting that you need to understand to become a champion in his sport. Let's hear what Harlan has to say. So all the way from Kansas in the United States, we've got our next champion shooter who has gone on to become a champion coach. Harlan Campbell, thanks for your time tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I threw a few names out there with some pretty close friends I've got in the ATA to match the criteria of the five shooters that we're doing in this series. And I only wanted to do one out of each discipline of shooting. And for the ATA, I asked who would be the best guy that is clearly a champion in their sport, that is a great coach. And virtually everybody came back with your name. So you must be doing something right in the coaching world as well. Do you enjoy the coaching? We'll get to your shooting career, but I'm, I'm curious. Not, a, not everybody who is a champion in the sport enjoys sharing their knowledge, but you obviously do. I really do enjoy shooting, uh, and I enjoy the coaching probably more than the shooting, especially at this point in time in my career. Um, you know, it's a way for me to kind of give something back um, you know, those guys that I've shot with my entire life, um, everybody wants to shoot well. Everybody wants to shoot well. And uh, if I can kind of help those guys along the way a little bit, then it's really, really pretty satisfying for me, not only on the competitive side of the game, but on the coaching side of the game. So I've always felt that I had some other information that I could give. Um, always kind of had a little bit of a different perspective on how I looked at the game and how I prepared for it and uh, passing some of that information along. I kind of get those, oh, I never thought of that moment, you know, from, from my students. And, and then when you see them be successful with it, um, it's, it's kind of double gratifying. So do you think that you have to be a champion shooter to be a champion coach? I don't believe so. Um, I think you need to have a very good understanding of the game, uh, the mechanics, the fundamentals of the game. Um, and the ATA game, there is a lot of clubhouse philosophy and a lot of front porch opinions. Um, they, they, they tend to get mixed up into the competitive game a little bit. And it's, you know, it, it, it's about style and, well, I do it this way and you can do it this way and so-and-so does it this way. But, um, I've always had that question as to why. And when you kind of disprove some of that clubhouse philosophy and those front porch opinions and those, those theories, like I said, it's just a way that I've looked at the game, the way that I, that I approach the game. Um, I, I, I work to approach the game from a, all of an advantage and, and try to eliminate all the disadvantages if I give targets back based only upon my skill, not upon my planning or preparation or understanding and knowledge of the venue, uh, then, then I've done the job to the best of my ability. But no, I really don't think you need to be a good shooter to be a good coach, but you do have to have a, a good depth and understanding of the game and the facets that the game does entail. Well said. Harlan, the, your record stands for itself. I mean, you've won the high overall four times at the Grand, the high all around the same amount. You've won the Clay Target Championship, the doubles. You don't have anything, I believe, to prove anymore at, at, at competitive level. But do you teach the same technique that you use to your students? Yes and no. Um, I teach them the fundamentals, the, the basics of shooting, uh, the mechanics, the fundamentals, uh, uh, points of impact, uh, those things that are a part of the shooting game. And, and certainly within the ATA discipline, you take the skeet, the sporting clays, the five stand, the international shooting, uh, or just duck hunting down on the river. Um, they're all different disciplines in those particular disciplines of shooting. Um, I try to get that student's the shooter's equation aligned to where point of impact, call to shot timing, 
uh, the mechanics of, of, of weight distribution, fundamentals of gun mount, head position, eye alignment, uh, face pressure, grip pressure, uh, all of those things that go into good shooting technique, I try to balance that for each and every shooter. Uh, from that point, they're, they're started in the right direction. Now, they still are going to have to grow their game visually. They're still going to have to grow it mechanically. They're still going to have to grow it mentally. Uh, they're going to have to to learn the game on a lot of different uh, on a lot of different stages. Uh, this is one that that I try to put them out there uh, with the concept of getting their best foot forward and getting them to start breaking targets from the from the very beginning. I'd like to rack your brain a lot more on the technical side of the sport because there is so much I'm sure we can learn from you. What I am curious is, uh, say a young person comes to you and they say that they want to be as successful as you or even try to just win one, you know, ATA championship. How many years would you say from the start to the end it would take to be able to achieve that on an average? You know, everybody learns at a, at a different speed and everybody excels uh, at a different speed and level. I, I can tell you from, from my shooting and my experience that I had shot uh, a little over a hundred thousand registered targets before I really felt that I had total command of my game, not just the shooting part of it, but the mental disciplines and the, the physical processes of the game, uh, making sure that I was 110% ready to call for and to do the best job that I could on every target every time. And that was one of the hardest lessons to learn was and, and trap shooting, it gets to be so, uh, so mundane. We get into squad speed and uh, squad rhythm and squad timing, and all of a sudden, they forget to turn the switch on. Uh, the minute that they remember to turn the switch on and say, okay, what is it that I have to do right now uh, to give myself the best effort on this target? Once they're able to do that and then know that they can control it, uh, sky's the limit from then on out. So on that basis, um, when people are going through um, and shooting each shot, do you recommend them having concentration for the entire round or having periods of time when they're distracted and then when they switch on? What do you sort of recommend in, in relation to that? Well, what I teach is kind of the stop and go method. Um, we've all learn things from our adolescent years and grade school and things like that. And um, I put the example in class, kind of like learning your ABCs. Uh, once you start in your ABC recital and you would miss a letter or, or kind of lose your place, the teacher would always tell you to stop, think about what you're doing and go back and start over. Um, as I've kind of put that together with dealing with distractions, dealing with annoyances, dealing with those inopportune thoughts that, that happen out there, uh, we follow that same process. So um, yes, you have a, a mental mantra, so to speak, a, a mental uh, thought process that you go to, and it basically follows a step-to-step -step process. If there's something that is not of the process, then you go back to the beginning and start the process again. So kind of a stop and go uh, process in itself. So um, you, you can't go out there and just concentrate uh, forever. Uh, you'll be totally exhausted within a very short period of time. So you have to learn to turn the concentration and the focus on and then obviously turn it off when, when it's time to kind of relax a little bit. Harlan, I always get a good laugh when I go onto the American trap shooting site, uh, trapshooters.com. It's a forum. <laughs> you probably yeah. well aware of and you laugh straight away. So you very well know where I'm going with this. There's, there's a lot of experts on there that <laughs> don't mind sharing their techniques, but I'm curious just on one of the basic fundamentals in ATA, and we call it down the line over here in Australia and in England, they call it the same. But for a two-eyed shooter, are you getting all of your students to start with their trap hold above the, the line or the roof line of the trap and one-eyed shooters do you get them to start on the roof because it's one of the most common questions we get asked well what i do is i honestly believe that that one and two-eyed shooters can shoot the target the same way um you know if you look at it more as a physical handicap and let's say you were physically handicapped with with only one eye uh, you can adjust hold points, you can adjust 
visual focus areas to account for a wider field of vision. Uh, some of the things that one and two eyed shooters are always uh, kind of misunderstood and, and mistaught about is that, well, one eyed shooters, you don't have depth perception. Well, most of the ATA shoot offs happen after, after dark, and we all know what happens to depth perception after dark. Uh, field of vision, you can adjust a stance and a setup uh, according to the one or the one eyed shooter. Um, Hold points, however, um, I, don't, I don't teach them to be right down off the house. I teach the hold point more of a parallel uh, position based in part of where the target on the arm, the base of the height stake, uh, back through where you stand at the 16 yard line and then on back towards the 27 yard line. Uh, those four positions in our game are on a constant parallel. So from there, whether whatever the target height is, uh, we start with a hold point position that is constant, um, independent of trap house height, uh, independent of, of background color and, and topography. So uh, you've got to start the gun in the same spot. You got to get the eyes in the same spot and make sure that they are correct in the type of focus that they're set in, uh, transitioning from a soft peripheral focus transitioning to a hard focus on the target. Um, and you're going to do that at a position above the gun barrel, not down through it or looking right at the edge of the trap house. So uh, you, I kind of make a baseball analogy in, in classroom that um, pitchers throwing 90 mile an hour fastballs at you. Are you going to adjust to the back of the batter's box or are you going to adjust to the front of the box um, to give yourself more time, more visual opportunity to, to lock onto the baseball. And it's the same concept in trap targets. Um, when you get that target right out of the house, looking right over top of the lip, uh, you see something, but you don't see a whole target. You don't see a clear target. You just see a streak or a blur. I'm very keen to ask you, for someone that's been in the All-American team as often as you have, um, you must be good at obviously not just singles, but doubles and handicap. What changes are you making to your gun from when you go from 16 yards to 27 yards. I'm not saying where you hold on the, the trap. What, what physical things are you doing different to your firearm? In our game, our target presentation um, is deemed uh, to be legal uh, at a target height between eight and 10 foot at a distance 30 feet in front of the house. Um, we look at the speed being 42 mile an hour, 43 mile an hour max, and hoping that that target uh, carries somewhere between 49, 51 yards. Um, once you get those constants in place, and once the point of impact is set at the correct yardage uh, involved at the 16 yard line, the, the mathematical equation of geometry works extensively all the way back to whatever yardage that you're going to shoot. So as long as your barrel stays in a constant parallel, uh, the eyes are going to go a little higher as a result of the point of impact being higher at the 27. But uh, in all actuality, I don't change anything. I, I take the same hole points, the same focus areas, uh, ob obviously a little higher to address the point of impact increase, but we all know the concept that is if you want a gun to shoot where you're looking, you need to be looking where the gun is shooting. So it's not shooting at the end of the, at the end of the barrel or right at the trap house lid, it's shooting at a position much higher out there into the target area. So, um, once those things are accounted for, you shoot the target exactly the same way at the 16 yard line as you would the 27. Do you use the um, aid of a pattern board to get your guns right for both yourself and for your students? Yes, ma'am, I do. And uh, what, what, do you, what pattern do you like to use yourself? What I set the 16 yard uh, line up with is I take the distance from the end of the gun barrel to the base of the height stake. And then basically it's just a simple equation as to how much rise do I want the shot to have to account for a neutral pattern or a pattern that's 15 inches high at that distance. Now that distance will measure 26 yards. Um, given the fact that you'll shoot a, a straightaway target and an angle target at a little different speed, I'll back that up another yard just to kind of 
put some consistency in that. So I'm giving every shooter basically the benefit of the doubt. But once I start that point of impact at that distance of 81 feet, 27 yards, I put that point of impact at 15 inches above my gun barrel. So the entire shot pattern impacts in a position above the barrel. So in terms of percentage, that's, am I hearing you correctly? Do you suggesting that's a 100% high shooting shot pattern? That is, uh, in, in, in that description, that is. Yeah. But in the game yeah. of trap shooting, I would say that that is more of a neutral pattern than one that was basically 100% high. Um, if you were, uh, the thing that breaks the targets is the shot. But understand that at a patterning board, you are shooting at a static target. And then at a clay target, you're shooting at a dynamic target. So you got to have some instance of, of, of lead figured in to that point of impact. Um, if not, uh, you, you end up mispointing the gun a lot of the times and coming out of the gun, maybe flinching a little bit because once the eyes and don't see it anymore, the brain quits computing uh, the shooting equation. And when that happens, the gun doesn't go off. You jerk the gun, you flinch, you do all those things that uh, you don't like to do ever. Every once in a while. I've recently heard that there's a bit of a new technique coming about in ATA. Um, it's been referred to me as vertical lead. Um, it's, it's a new terminology to me, but I've been explained that it's a pattern of anywhere from 100 to 200 percent high. And people are holding so high that really all they're having to do is go left and right, not really any movement up. Um, what is your views on that? Is that something that is trending? Well, it's there is a, this is kind of the same thing we've just talked about by positioning that point of impact to be in a position above your gun barrel, you are in fact creating vertical lead. Uh, you're pointing that target at a six o'clock position on a straightaway, but you're anticipating where that target is going to be once the shot pattern gets to the target. So a lot of lock time involved in creating the correct vertical lead. you got visual lock time. You're going to have mental lock time, physical lock time. Uh, you're going to have the mechanical lock time that basically is the one everybody talks about as well. My trigger is faster than yours or this brand of gun has a faster trigger. But then you've got, you've got uh, shell speed and, and distance that the shot has to travel. So in all instances where that point of aim is is created at a pattern board is not where it's going to be out on the field so that's where you're getting into the the vertical lead once it is accomplished um yes it it, it can be a game that you just go left and right but uh, unfortunately we don't have the consistency in the targets because of mother nature uh, you get high targets, you get low targets, you get targets that drop out from under you. So, um, yeah, it's not just a, a, a new style of shooting. It's one that is taking advantage of every pellet within the shot charge and creating a maximum pattern performance as possible. I'd like to know what chokes you recommend for singles, doubles, and handicap. I, I go... Throughout the year, I'll shoot somewhere between modified and improved modified um, throughout the country, uh, going from early spring to this time of the year in the fall. Um, handicap, I'm, I'm shooting 35 to 37 thousandths. Um, and doubles, I will shoot uh, a lot of times 15 thousandths on the first barrel, uh, like a light modified, and then uh, a full to an improved modified on the second shot and doubles. I could talk to you all night about some of the technical <laughs> things because they, I found, particularly in this series that we've done, there are definitely two types of coaches. Coaches that know a lot about the mechanics of the sport but have the ability when they go onto the line and put all that out of their head and just shoot. And there are coaches that just coach on natural ability and don't want to know where their guns are shooting. And, and you're definitely not one of those. You're, you fall into the first category because you seem to be, Harlan, you've got to know. It, it seems to be you are one of these people that really want to know what happens. Well, my, my philosophy in, in, my, in my shooting game, and 
especially as I started shooting more and more. And uh, I always felt that if I could outthink you, if I could outplan you, I wasn't going to have to outshoot you. Um, <laughs> because shooters would go out there and, you know, they, they'd go out there, they'd hope and wish, but hopes and wishes are not game plans and strategies. Um, like I said, I wanted to figure out a way that if I was going to give targets back, because in our sport, you're shooting against shooters of likability. Uh, when you get to a, a grand American and an overall, every shooter that is viable in that overall championship has skills. Um, there was no doubt about it. If, if they didn't have the skills, they wouldn't be there. Um, so what makes the difference at the end of the week is who wins the overall or, you know, who doesn't. So um, that game plan became very, very important, very effective. Uh, statistically, if you can figure out a way to put a target in the X column independent of your shooting, um, that's, that's, a, that's a big plus. You, you, you can't put a target there any better than that way. I'd like to talk about your roots in the sport. When your first win at the Grand, you were in your late thirties. You weren't a new—I don't know if you were a new shooter, but you were—you were relatively old to win your first event. And I noticed the gap between your first event and the last event you won at the Grand was 19 years, I think it is, or 18 years. But you've had people like Ray Stafford or Leo Harrison that have put. 34 or 35 years between their first win and their their last win at the Grand American. But why were you a late bloomer? Did you not shoot any clay targets as a kid or did you have no interest in it? I'm just surprised that you were relatively old before you started to be successful. My first love was always to play golf. Um, I played in high school, played in college, played competitive golf after college. Um, you know, I was kind of torn between making a decision. Do I want to shoot trap or do I want to play golf? And um, growing up in Western Kansas, uh, you can kind of imagine there, you know, they're not the lush green courses that you see, uh, you know, on the PGA tour or any of those things. So um, I made a decision uh, to shoot trap. Um, keep in mind for me to go basically to any of the big shoots, it's, it's a, it, it's a thousand miles, 500 minimum, 1, 1,500 maximum. So it took a lot of logistics to kind of get me into a position that I could go and do those things. Um, to, to basically start shooting full time, I, I really felt that I needed to be debt free and kind of own the stuff that, that I had and um, not be in a position that, you know, I could go out for two weeks and then had to come back home and work for another month. So um, I got myself in a position financially that I could go do that. And uh, from that point in time, it's been pretty good. Harlan, there's more money in golf, mate. The only way to make a small fortune in trap shooting is to start with a big fortune. But <laughs> you clearly yeah. enjoy your trap shooting. You mentioned, um, I read your bio, and you mentioned you were influenced a little bit in your early days in your career by guys like Ray Stafford. Um it, it, it Ray's still shooting, I take it. I saw that he shot at the Grand American. But one of the great things I find in your sport is that you can have guys of Ray Stafford's age being competitive. And then you go and look at the grand results this year. And a guy that we've already interviewed was Dagan Voigtman, a 19-year-old boy that really just had a, a sensational Grand American. But I asked him, why do you shoot so well off 27 yards, Dagan? And he looked at me and said, I don't know. I've never thought about it. I'll just try harder. <laughs> so, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on young Dagan's achievements at the Grand this year? And then second of all, your thoughts on some of the people that you followed, like Ray Stafford and Leo Harrison. Dagan is a, is a, is a tremendous talent, um, you know, and has a lot of years of, of exceptional shooting ahead of him. Um, he's been shooting pretty good the last couple of years, uh, out on the circuit, uh, out in the regular uh, shooting area. So, um, you know, it's certainly no, it's not uncommon for, for him to do that. Uh, like I said, he's 19 years old. He's, he's got good eyes and um, uh, there's just a lot of good things, a lot of good positive things that are, that are with him in his game right now. Um, 
but he's certainly one of the starters that are coming up and certainly going to be uh, in a position to make my life a lot tougher uh, in the future. <laughs> um, Leo and Ray, you know, uh, those guys, uh, Ray, I've known for a lot of years. He grew up, uh, was born and raised in Bird City, Kansas. So he's a, he's a Kansas boy by birth and uh, moved to Colorado by choice, I guess. But um, the thing that always inspired me about Ray was, uh, was his competitive attitude, his, his, his competitive drive. It didn't matter what Ray was doing, where he was at. Um, Ray came there to win. Uh, you see that in a lot of shooters, uh, especially in those eras. Uh, KOE is another one. Um, Leo was certainly another shooter of that. Uh, Leo and I became good friends years ago and uh, shared a lot of morning duck hunts together. So, um, but when he'd come out and would go hunting, you know, we never did talk about trap shooting. We, we always talked about duck hunting or pheasant hunting or whatever we were doing at the time. But um, those guys are, they're just that consummate competitor. Uh, every time they step to the line, you know, they're going to give you 110%. And, um, you never doubted that for one minute. And, it, and you always knew that it was going to take 110% out of you uh, to even get close to them. So, uh, you know, Dagan is just starting into that arena right now. Um, like I said, it's a, uh, it was a tremendous grand. All of the, all of the young shooters shot well out there. So um, I look for that to happen a lot more. Speaking of talent, do you think that you can spot a talented shooter or do you think that you can take anyone and create them into a great shooter? It depends on how bad they want to become that shooter. You know, everybody can, can talk the talk, but you know, when it comes down to where your body's a, a screaming at you that it wants to quit and you've got to break the last 25 to get in the shoot off or to win the shoot off, uh, even when you just got to break the last five, um, to get into that level of championship shooting and, and to be consistent in it, you're going to face things that you've never faced before. You're going to face some of your worst fears, some of your biggest demons. Um, you're going to be put in a position to where there's only going to be one thought that is going to be able to be in your mind at that point in time. And that is, what is it that I have to do right now? You know, if you can put yourself into that realm, yes, uh, championship shooting might be for you. Um, if you have a hard time putting two coherent thoughts together, uh, you may want to take up bowling, but it's, uh, it, 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 it kind of depends. I, I really think that, yeah, I see shooters that have the ability, uh, they have a unbelievably good set of tools, but they're still very green. You know, they still haven't polished any of that stuff yet. And, it, it just takes time. It takes time to learn the game. It takes time to, to learn about yourselves and, and to learn how to be competitive, not just, not just that you're a competitor, but how to be competitive in the sport. Um, you know, there's times that you need to be shooting and there's times that you need to be resting. And a lot of the, a lot of the extracurricular activities get shooters into trouble at some of these major competitions and you know we still have to enjoy the shoot we still have to enjoy the camaraderie and of our friends and and our and our families but you know there's there's a time when you know tomorrow we got to shoot 200 singles tonight's not the time to be you know having a wild party so <laughs> it's uh, sometimes you got to give up a lot of things that you like to to take home that championship or to you know to become that shooter that you want to be and and those are just some of the things that shooters have to learn they have to deal with them can you run me through your thoughts on a training day, what you would recommend for a training day, and also the importance of um, the balance between training, competition, and the extra things. You know, do, do you do things like encourage people to do gym or see psychologists, you know, the extra stuff? Is, is what, what is your master plan? Uh, obviously, shooting takes on a, a little bit of, a, of an athleticism, especially when you're shooting 300 targets a day and 1500 targets in an overall um, you're shooting them in uh, some of the worst conditions that you could possibly imagine uh, but you know you're gonna have to be physically strong enough to 
to mount your gun physically strong enough to control the gun uh, every single time. Uh, you can't get weak in the shoulders or weak in the back. And, um, you know, your mechanics are going to pay big dividends if you can control that thing. Um, it's just a tool, but you're going to have to be conditioned enough to control that. So, yes, practice is, is very important, especially in the early part of your career. Uh, but once you get the correct set of mechanics in place, the correct set of visual disciplines accounted for, and you're able to make the shot more than two or three times out of 25, when you're able to actually point the target 25 times and, and deliver the shot correctly 25 times, then it's no more than just a continuation of doing that. Um, you know, the thing that I always felt with my practice was, is I never could put myself into a position to where I felt the pressure. So, you know, I'd go out and shoot 25 targets. That'd make 25 perfect gun points. So what did that really accomplish? But, you know, if I'm sitting there and somebody says, well, let's shoot for a dollar. I says, well, let's shoot for a hundred or let's shoot for everything in our billfolds. Then it was a whole different set of pressures that were involved. Um, so, yeah, you can go out and you can do some shooting. And, and you alluded to the fact that it's got to be not only practice and, and, and polish and, and refinement, but you also have to have that competitive opportunity to see where you stand with the rest of your shooters and just how you are working and coming along with your training and practice. Um, after every event, after every practice, I would always sit down and go through a, a game plan and kind of a debriefing as to what did I do right? What did I do wrong? How well did I see the target? What target, what trap particularly gave me uh, a problem or, or caused a, a you know, an unsolicited miss. Uh, did I miss a read? Did I did I miss something that that possibly I will not miss the next time? So I sat down and 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 kind of would go through my practice and go through my competitive rounds and and just start looking at that stuff, seeing where my strengths were, seeing where my weaknesses were, what my statistics were, and then just start working at at polishing the strengths and and eliminating the weaknesses. Harlan, you're not the first shooter from Kansas we've actually interviewed in this champion series, and I'll be interested in your comments. We, inter we interviewed Derek Mine not long after the Grand, and he didn't shoot too badly at the Grand American, but he's preparing, of course, for the Olympic Games next year in Tokyo. And a question I asked Derek is, is how are you going to prepare? He said, well, I'm going to three sporting shoots next week and then I'm off to the World American Skeet titles and then he's got some more ATA planned. His views are a little similar to yours, that he needs to find out about the little man and his head under pressure. And he doesn't really care what event it's in. He just wants to put it all on the line each time and find out how he reacts under pressure, which is essentially what you're saying today. Um, what, what are your thoughts on cross-training in other clay target disciplines to prepare for an ATA tournament? I, I would do some, some skeet shooting and some sporting clay shooting from time to time. And it's, it's no more than just the opportunity for me to feel the gun go off, um, you know, to put myself into a position to where, you know, I'm not having to be as, as, as mentally sharp or as mentally focused, um, as I would have be in a, in a particularly a competitive situation. Um, I do that a little bit more just to relax, you know, to enjoy my friends and, you know, go to the, go to the sporting clays course and, and, you know, have a, have a little bit of fun. Um, where Derek is, a is, is, you know, shooting the international game and is certainly very, uh, very, very strong in the, in the sporting clays world. And, and, and I got to tell you, I have all the, the admiration for him. He is as good a crossover shooter uh, as I've seen in a lot of years. And, you know, the guy who kind of held that little title for the longest time was Mr. Ray Stafford. But Derek is, is, is certainly that guy. And, you know, it doesn't matter what sport he, he, he loads up and gets ready to go. You know, you're going to get a hundred percent from him. And, and I think the, I think the, I think the other international shooters are going to are kind of in for a surprise. Uh, we've not necessarily ever had a competitor 
with Derek's mentality. Uh, I think they're going to see somebody that's, uh, the, they might have awoken a sleeping giant, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> He's, uh, he, I agree. He's one of the best all round shoes. Maybe George Digweed from England is the only other. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Max Ray Stafford. Um, I'm interested also in your thoughts on the Grand American. You've shot in the Grand, obviously, at Vandalia in Ohio. Actually, Lauren and I went to the Centenary Grand in 1999. I, I had just had a wonderful time there. And then they moved it to Sparta. And this year they moved it for COVID reasons to Missouri. What's your favourite yeah. Grand out of those three? Well, um, I can say I've won championships in two of the three. Um, um, I won championships in Vandalia, and then I certainly won championships in Sparta. Um, you know, my my first love is always Vandalia uh, for the history and you know just the grounds and uh, everything that 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 was. Um, you know, it was kind of where trap shooting become of age and uh, become more mainline and and in line with that stuff. Uh, but we just had outgrown that particular facility. Um, Sparta, uh, you know, the older folks and the older shooter demographic, you know, they still have that love and, and the memories of, of Vandalia. But, you know, there's a, there's a whole nother demographic out there that has the love of Sparta. You know, they never saw Vandalia. So um, I think as we went into Missouri this year, uh, I think everyone's going to be really glad that we hopefully get to go back to Sparta next year uh, because of the closeness and the, you know, just the, the congestion uh, that there, that there, that there was there in Missouri, but, you know, they did a tremendous job of having that shoot on, on a short notice type basis. But, um, you know, championships are championships and they are shot for at many different venues. Um, uh, it doesn't matter the venue, the championship is what matters. So, uh, I'm, I'm happy to go, go anywhere, you know, let's bring it to Tribune. We'll shoot out here in my yeah. backyard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as far as shooters go, you're still just a young adolescent. You've got plenty of years ahead of you. Do you have any, um, any specific goals achieving so much already? Well, uh, I keep telling myself I'm not as old as I feel, but, uh, sometimes it's hard to tell myself that every day, but, you know, my, my goal right now is I've been successful at, at every level of the game. Um, I'm not sure there's not a trophy out there that I haven't won uh, outside of the Grand American Handicap. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, and I've always, always seemed to tell myself I don't need to be as, as good as I ever was. I just need to be as good once as I, as, as I was. So, um, you know, that'll, that'll happen. Maybe, maybe it will, maybe it won't, but, you know, my career has been very blessed and I've been very fortunate. And um, if that handicap championship eludes me, then, you know, my, my, my trap shooting career has been wholly fulfilled. We all know that in order to hit a target, the best way to do that is to silence, as Russell explained before, the little man in our head, at least for a short period of time when we take the shot. And based on the amount of information and knowledge that we can clearly see that you have, um, do you find that when you're doing a lot of coaching, at times it can be hard to silence that little man in your head giving all that extra instruction? Uh, you kind of look at it as a conscious, subconscious conversation. Um, you know, I kind of look at it this way. When I mount the gun and my conscious voice tells me that this is a mismounted shotgun, that's the one you need to be listening to. That subconscious voice says, oh, it's okay, it's close enough, we've been here before, don't draw attention to ourselves, don't slow the squad down, and then you hear that call pull, and it's like, okay, who was that? Who's in control here? Um, my shooting has, has been 100% that I want to be in control, and that conscious subconscious voice that goes on in my head, I stick a sock in that subconscious voice and throw him in the bottom drawer and chain it shut. We don't have many conversations. So it's, <laughs> it's pretty much cut and dried that there's going to be one captain out there and that's going to be me. So yeah. I want to know how to get that sock in the drawer. Can you tell me? Cause that's like, <laughs> if everyone can work that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I want to ask you a hypothetical question and um, 
One thing you Americans do better than anyone in the world is off your handicap shooting off 27 yards. You guys truly have that worked out. Um, down the line, or ATA is shot in different ways all over the world. Here in Australia, our handicap events, you get two shots at a target from 25 metres. And we certainly haven't worked that out. But do you think in your lifetime you will see a foreigner winning an ATA ring? An Australian in 1994, his name was Bill Isles, and you may have met him, but he comes yeah. second in the Clay Target Championship to Ron Alcariza. And I, I still rate that as one of the best ever efforts from, from a foreigner at the Grand American. But apart from maybe Paul Chaplow from England, who doesn't go to the Grand, he goes to the event in Tucson every year. I don't know what the name of that Grand is, but he's reasonably competitive there. But I really don't see too many foreigners scaring you guys too much. Do you think we'll ever see that happen? Um, I think the gentleman that you're talking about, Paul Chapow, um, I think he certainly does have the ability to win a major championship in uh, the ATA game. Um, I got the opportunity to go to the Craigoff Cup in Wales a couple of years ago and um, had the uh, was fortunate enough to shoot that down the line uh, shooting that you guys do over there. Um, I shot well, uh, but like I said, I'm so used to just a one barrel game that boy, that second barrel, it just caught me off guard a couple times and it, um, it made the difference, but you know, I certainly saw things that I shot well enough that, you know, I don't doubt in my mind that I couldn't do that. I might want to bring my single barrel over, <laughs> pay a little more, pay a little more attention to, to what I'm doing. Just, but, just uh, Matt, when you went to Wales, did you just shoot your doubles under and over barrel on your gun? They were 32 inch barrels. Yes. So what do you shoot? How many inch barrels do you shoot at singles? Uh, I shoot a, an unsingle uh, uh, high rib gun, uh, a, a trap special barrel. Is it 34 inches or 32? Yes, it is. It's 34. So if I got you a 34 inch double barrel or under and over barrel, do you think you would have shot that better in Wales? No, no, I shot all right. I had a, I had two 99s in the, in the, in the 200 bird championship and, um, the thing that got me so that I was having issues with is that I had a high vis sight on my gun and inside those shooting boxes, those little mini garages, I wasn't getting enough light on the, on the light pipe yeah. to see it. So I was losing uh, my, my, I was losing the front of the gun as I would go to the target and um, for not having what I needed over there at that point in time, I felt I did really, really well, but it cost me a target or two. Uh, but now I, I don't know that I would need anything in a 34 inch barrel and um, any of that stuff. I think a, a 32 inch over and under would be more than enough. Well, we do a lot of down the line shooting here in Australia and quite a few Australians have gone over to the grand and competed there and they've all come back better shooters for the experience. But um, Leo uh, went to a couple of our national titles down here and took home a few of our national championships over the years. Is coming down to Australia something that you'd ever want to do? Because you'd be more than welcome here by a lot of people. <laughs> I, I, I certainly um, enjoyed my, my time in Europe and, and shooting the Craig Golf Cup and that deal. And, and I told those guys that I was coming back, you know, so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, my deal is, is I'll maybe run into Paul out at Spring Grand and kind of visit with him a little bit and kind of see what, what his plans are. And uh, maybe we get this pandemic and this COVID deal behind us a little bit. And maybe we can start making some plans to come do that. Well, Paul, yeah. Paul actually came to Australia and won one of our championships as well. So please, <laughs> um, we'd love to have him back also. But it, it's great to hear that maybe that's something that you have. You do have to be careful coming here, though. Once you get here, they don't let you leave. <laughs> well, that's good. That, that wouldn't hurt nothing. I did have a have a have a, a student one time call me um, and wanted to do a clinic in Australia, and I got to looking at the map and trying to figure out where it was, and uh, we landed in I 
is Sydney the one that has the the big uh, yeah. orchestra deal out there yeah. beside it? Is that the Opera House yeah. they call it? Okay, and then he said, "Well, then from there it's like a day and a half somewhere, and you can only get there by boat, and and <laughs> when the water's high and all of this stuff." And I got this thinking, you know, it might be a lot easier for you to come to Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we never did go, but sometime maybe. Well, there's not too many places in Australia. Once you land here, you've got to go by boat. I think <laughs> I think that guy was taking you to New Zealand. I don't think he was Australian. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's been a great pleasure to catch up with you today. Um, we really appreciate the knowledge that you've shared. You do have a big following down here, but... Um, this will be viewed all over the world. And there's no doubt a lot of the things that you've spoken about are relevant, not just to the ATA, they're relevant to every other discipline of clay target shooting. So it's been an absolute pleasure to share your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me, folks. I appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you one day at the Grand. Take care until all then. Right. You, you come to the Grand, we'll, uh, we'll give you the tour. Amazing. Thanks, Harlan. Thank you. Have a good day.